Hello, this Young in Life listeners. Deb and I want to make sure that you know about this opportunity to participate in the Philadelphia Jung Seminar. And this is a seminar for people who are really interested in reading, studying, discussing uh, Jung and works by some of Jung's, Jung's colleagues and other theorists. And you can find out more about it by going online to cgjungphiladelphia.com. Dot org. And it meets four times in the fall and four times in the spring. It meets over the course of a weekend, Friday afternoons and, and all day on Saturday. And this year it's going to be hybrid. So the first meeting in September will be in person in Philadelphia. The remaining three weekends, one each in October, November and December, will be online. And in the spring, the meetings in February, March, and April will be online, and the final meeting in May will be in Philadelphia. So if you're a little further afield and you still want to participate, this might be a great opportunity to do so because the travel will be minimal. Yes. And the syllabus this year is carrying the theme of Jung's travels. So it is a particularly varied a uh, syllabus that includes things like uh, yoga and uh, some of the themes from far afield it, with a really stellar list of presenters. And it, too, is online. You can take a look at it and get the um, instructions for applying at cgyoungphiladelphia.org. So we, we hope to see some of you there. Deb and I ran it together for many years, and we're occasionally presenters ourselves, um, and we're certainly in the background supporting it. So I hope, I hope we'll see some of you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about compartmentalization, uh, the way in which we all establish kind of categories like work life and home life, all kinds of chores, relationships, and how does it or does it relate to kind of dissociative experiences? How does it relate to being of two minds about something? How might it relate to denial, that I kind of know something, but I don't really want to know something? And how might it even relate to something as powerful as hypocrisy, the thing we certainly don't want to be? But here we are with our, uh, the dissociative nature, according to Jung, of, of the psyche, uh, that we do have these different compartments, different areas of consciousness, and we're going to walk around it and explore it. It strikes me that compartmentalization is so ubiquitous that often we don't even see it, or perhaps don't even bring attention to it, that we seem to believe one thing really passionately when we're at work, and then when we're out with our friends having a couple of beers, we'll you know, vociferously champion the opposite idea and feel equally passionate in both environments. People are at church and they're really focused on virtue and their alignment with virtue. And then, then they go home and a couple of days later, they're doing something uh, a bit shady and they're aware, you know, that both mm -hmm. of these values are in them. And somehow as hum human beings, we have this way kind of moving between these opposites and on a certain level, knowing that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, you know, one of the things maybe that d differentiates compartmentalization from, from something that looks more dissociative is that we're sort of holding both things in awareness at the same time, but they're kind of opposites. I mean, I think it's a fascinating topic and there's lots of places to go, but I almost want to start off by just saying, hey, look, we're complicated. Mm 
<laughs> it's really complicated being human. And not to expect ourselves to be too consistent. You know, what did, was it Walt Whitman who, who talked about uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds mm -hmm. and, and who said, uh, you know, I am, I am a multitude. So we, we, are, we are just complicated. And there are going to be contradictions that exist within each of us. Now he said, do I contradict myself? Uh, well, then I contradict myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so for sure, uh, we are complicated. And for sure, we have different self-states, uh, including complexes that can kind of take us over, and including the various aspects of our persona um, that just as Joseph, you mentioned, I mean, we present a different side of ourselves, you know, having TGIF drinks with our friends uh, than we do in the office. Yeah. I, and I think the impulse to be too consistent can lead to a kind of fanaticism. Some tolerance for inconsistency is, is perhaps, uh, you know, holding our eye arms wide enough to embrace all of us is perhaps the attitude I want to start off with. I might even say that if we hold ourselves too rigidly and we veer into a kind of fanaticism is, then what happens to shadow? Uh, then we've, we haven't embraced ourselves. We've simply excluded parts of ourselves and relegated them to the unconscious as if they don't exist. And I think there's an enormous, bizarre pressure for absolute continuity. You know, a politician comes forward, is, has, a, has a particular agenda, perhaps many people think highly of, then somebody finds a paper they wrote in college that has a different position. And then as this is brought to the public, see, well, look at what he said now, but 25 years ago... He believed this opposite thing and this strange reaction we have, you know, that, oh, mm -hmm. well, that discounts him or this, he's a scoundrel because it seems that he believes both of these things. Mm -hmm. and, and there's something so disingenuous about punishing somebody for holding, you know, different attitudes mm -hmm. at different parts of your life. But even at, in the same moment, I think, as you said, Lisa, to hold several perspectives, some of which are against each other, around a given topic is part of the complexity of human nature and is essential to what Jung called individuation. Because in brief, Jung felt that we had to learn to look at a single object in the psyche from a thinking perspective, a feeling perspective, an intuitive perspective, and a physical perspective that line up with the four functions, thinking, feeling, intuition, and sensing. And he called that circumambulation, that in many initiation rituals in the ancient world, the candidate would look at the altar, the object, the sacred object at the altar, and have to traverse each of the walls very crisply and often there would be a figure a costumed figure at each of the walls offering both a challenge as well as a kind of perspective on the mystery that we're often at odds there's something about us as human beings that we actually benefit from seeing something in many different ways sure yeah and the idea of compartmentalization, I think, is related to the idea of paradox, because paradox, I think the definition of it is something like two, two opposite things that are both true. And the ability to, I think Jung at one point said something like the ability to, to uh, kind of be okay with paradox is a sign of psychological maturity he also wrote, only the paradox comes anywhere near to comprehending the fullness of life. I think that is ultimately also how he defined psyche, is that ultimately what is psyche? Paradox. So just unpacking the idea of compartmentalization, 
versus this other phenomenon of the psyche. The compartmentalization is a fairly rational and sophisticated defense against feeling confused or anxious or ambivalent in a way that locks us up too much. So we have an instinctive way of putting one issue to the right, so to speak, and another issue to the left. And depending on whether or not we step right or left, we can feel a shifting allegiance between those things. If we were talking to ourselves about it with compartmentalization, the ego would be able to consciously know and admit. It wouldn't be a mystery. Yes, I absolutely feel torn up and horrified when I see animal rights videos and think everything should be changed around the way that animals are treated. And later in the day, I'm having a hamburger (laughs) and enjoying it and setting aside those very painful videos and images. And that happens all the time, that kind of compartmentalization which allows us to not be overly distraught about the incongruity. You know, and I think, I think the animal rights one is actually a great example of compartmentalization because you know, if you do allow yourself to become aware of how animals are, are often treated in factory farming, it's, it's really just frankly horrendous. But most of us sort of take that on board to some extent or another and then go about our days with our habits unchanged. And to marry those two things, we may engage in rationalization. So we tell ourselves that, uh, you know, that probably farms, you know, most farms are more humane or that, uh, you know, it would be impossible for us to stop eating meat. It's a requirement. I mean, I, I struggle with this too, because I, I've, I've been a vegetarian since I was very young, but I, I've i recently become kind of more concerned about animal welfare, and, and I would like to move toward veganism, but I just cannot give up Greek yogurt. It's just too good. <laughs> And it compartmentalization is incredibly helpful because I can know what I know and yet I can set it aside and kind of put that in its own little box and go ahead and consume my very delicious Greek yogurt. I'm thinking about um, how and to what extent it, it's a question of degree. Mm. The contradiction between, you know, caring about animals and animals having a decent life and a decent death uh, versus eating the meat that is packaged packaged and packaged all over the grocery store shelves. Um, and I do eat meat. Versus knowing, for example, uh, that somebody that we know uh, who is upright and decent and has you know status in the community, is also doing something heinous in his private life. Uh, Let's say uh, child abuse, or, you know, some recent cases have had it, you know, even something like uh, trafficking. And uh, where is that tipping point inside of where it becomes, how do we decide when it's intolerable, when it is too great a transgression to be compartmentalized? I don't know that there's an answer to that, the way I phrased it, uh, but that there is a place where it becomes a matter of conscience. Well, I have another example, which is climate change. Mm. I mean, if, if if you read the news reports about what the scientists are saying, it's, it's really, really grim and frightening. And, you know, I, I do a little bit here and there what I can to sort of reduce my carbon footprint. But I suppose if I were really going to take on board the magnitude of what I'm reading about, I would, I don't know, I'd go off the grid. I mean, th- there is a sense of how overwhelming the problem is and sort of no matter what I do, it's not going to make that big a difference. So 
my most recent vehicle vehicle purchase, I got a, a you know a hybrid vehicle. That's like okay, but mostly I continue to live my life as as I always have, and I'm I'm just kind of constantly where there's some kind of uh, cognitive dissonance or friction around that that what the way we're all living is not sustainable. So there, there's that compartmentalization. You know, I can sort of take on board that, uh, you know, we're in a really dire situation as a species, and yet I still traveled to Europe recently. This lifts up my idea that it's a spectrum. I like that phrase of cognitive dissonance. of like, well, this, these two things don't quite go together, but the implication in cognitive dis- dissonance is, well, it's not that big a deal. Uh, versus something that is intolerable and heinous and and wrong. And I guess my point is, why isn't climate change intolerable and wrong? Because the scope of it can't even be imagined. So you're you're talking about trafficking or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, in some sense, I think what's happening to the planet is, you know, sort of beyond our ability even to take in. So it's interesting, Deb, I mean, your question is, where does it become, what's the tipping yes. point? And I think the disturbing thing about compartmentalization is that really there kind of is none. There isn't a clear line where it's like, mm-hmm. oh, can't do that. I mean, or, or even to take another example, the people in Jonestown who were, were told by Jim Jones we all need to drink this Kool-Aid that's been laced with cyanide. Give it to your children first. You know, it's sort of the, the human psyche is able to take on board these really horrible things and behave as if they're normal. And, and I, I'm, you know, it's not just the parents at Jonestown who are giving their kids cyanide. I'm, I'm sort of pointing the finger at myself, too. That even knowing what's going on with the planet, there I, there I went and bought plane tickets to Europe. And so one theory about compartmentalization is that when the two different uh, ideas, attitudes, or behaviors are, are close to each other, and we're holding them very tightly, that we either feel too much confusion, guilt, shame, or anxiety. And so the solution is developing enough muscle to consciously hold these complicated feelings. Like you said, buying the car as I'm keenly aware of what's happening with the climate crisis and feeling perhaps guilt or anxiety and being able to tolerate that in the midst of making the best choice we can at the moment. But all defenses in one way or another are ways of coping with affective states, feeling states that we think at least in the moment are intolerable or maybe even unsurvivable. So whether it's uh, eating meat and being aware of the suffering that happened to uh, farm animals, winging our way to Paris and really understanding, tolerating the shame of introducing all these hydrocarbons into the environment. And while that may have you know, a bit of a spoiling effect on whether or not we're enjoying what's going on, there's something integrated, laudable, and honest about being able to hold the discomfort. I'm also thinking about size of you know, what is a, a problem where, you know, I can have a sense anyway that I have some impact? Uh, so I could, you know, embrace a, a vegetarian way of living, for example. And that that might be, you know, really more of a personal issue of I don't like the cognitive dissonance and the the opposition and clash of values within myself, so I do that. Climate change, it's so big and so worldwide that we also have that sense of, well, this is the world we live in, and what's the point of my foregoing a trip to wherever uh, where, where it will not make any difference to the world, but it will make a difference to me? 
to not be able to go to X or Y or Z. So I, I think there is that question of um, where we relate it to ourselves. You know, I clearly think that compartmentalization is good and important and, you know, sort of put my stake in the ground here when we started talking about it and saying, hey, we're all complicated. We, we wouldn't be able to sort of get out of bed in the morning and live our life if we couldn't tolerate some uh, conflict, contradiction, inconsistency. And at the same time, I do also think our ability to compartmentalize uh, just as humans is really frightening. Mm-hmm. Because I do think there's almost nothing we can't do because of it. We can't rationalize. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, Hannah Arendt and her banality of evil. You know, it's like, I was just going to work, you know, which is, which is what the, the people who worked in the, in the camps, um, in, in the, the Nazi death camps, you know, it was just, they were just going to work. And that's, that's where Hannah Arendt came up with this phrase, the banality of evil, you know, that we, that we can just, uh, we can rationalize anything. And it, it is a, a maybe necessary thing about being human, but it, it is, it is a really frightening thing for our species too. So I'm, I'm sort of holding it in a bit of awe at both its adaptive function, but it's, it's sort of terrifying consequences. It really is a call, isn't it? To, for each of us to weigh uh, how we live, what we choose, <laughs> and simply, as a, as a start anyway, really be conscious of, wait mm-hmm. a minute, uh, have I really chosen this? Does it really matter to me to think about it? But I also want to go uh, in a different direction, because... You know, we've all worked with people, and probably everyone knows someone. I think we've all experienced ourselves what happens when we can't compartmentalize, when we get obsessive about something. Uh, you know, I, the person who can't leave the house without checking the locks half a dozen times or more. Intrusive thoughts about, you know, for example, the thing that a person in his 60s or 70s is plagued by some unkind or unwitting thing he did in high school that it continues to come up uh, on and off and that there's a failure there of the ability to compartmentalize, to put, set it aside, uh, not only for just for daily functioning, but for some equanimity and peace of mind as a person goes about his or her day. Yeah, it would be absolutely paralyzing. And it can be in in extreme cases. And the task is often, uh, you know, how to compartmentalize, how to how to help someone learn how to do that, how to how to change the channel, as it were, from this intrusive thought uh, to something else to think about, to do, to focus on, how to step in and step out of a of a troubling situation or, uh, you know, a preoccupying subject or thought. And do you have thoughts about how people can change the channel? Well, uh, the thoughts that I have are, I, I think changing the channel is a good image, and I think the stepping in and stepping out. But uh, sometimes physical movement can help of go out and take a walk, uh, talk to somebody, Engage in an activity that that the person finds interesting or engrossing or something that really uh, requires attention. Uh, so it's really a practice of where and how do we direct our attention. And we're directing our attention all the time, every day, somewhere. And uh, so in a way, it's a process of paying attention to how we pay attention and, and how do we operate that system a little better. The other place I think where compartmentalization is inadequate is is when someone is really dissociative. You know, when the contradiction is not in consciousness. And in both of these cases that I'm uh, offering here as examples, it's the it's when the unconscious kind of takes over consciousness. 
it can go both ways. Consciousness can be overly rigid and in denial or dissonant or a hundred things. At the same time, the unconscious can sometimes, like the Nile, sort of flood the banks of the ego and take over. You know, we have seen people sometimes, uh, when we lived in New York, there were people on the street who were clearly dissociative in a different world and talking about something that was entirely unrelated uh, to being on a street in Brooklyn. Well, it may be that dissociation is is on that spectrum of defenses that get some kind of psychic material away from us. Because when it's close, we at least believe it's intolerable. So whether it's on a very common level where we simply tolerate believing in fundamentally incongruent things all the way to the person who's disabled because they've unconsciously abandoned many aspects of reality in favor of a some kind of unconscious constructed fantasy because so much of reality is intolerable to the person. I think in all the examples, there's a cost. It's costly to break things apart and store them in different places, whether it's extreme or subtle. But that when we cut our ideas apart, our attitudes, our behaviors, or even cut parts of reality away, that we lose parts of ourselves. We lose functionality in a substantial way. And from a Jungian standpoint, it stymies the attempt of the self to incarnate in the personality. The self being the archetype that includes all of these elements. So anytime we move away from including the paradox towards chopping things up and living in the chopped up space, we've made it that much harder for the archetype of wholeness to descend. I really like how you put it, of what is the cost. Because one way or another, consciously, unconsciously, we've we've made a choice, and there's there's a cost. Uh, So it may not be about, you know, the, you know, should I go on that trip to a foreign country or not, but at least taking into account there is a cost and I am making a decision that I'm, I'm going to do this. And bearing it, I am adding to the carbon footprint. And do I want to pay? There are organizations now where you can pay somehow carbon bear part offsets, of the cost, yeah. literal financial cost of, mm-hmm. of adding to the carbon footprint. And you know what? I've looked at those websites, and man, it is expensive. It's not an extra $50. It's Mm -hmm. hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. But how do we take into our consideration what is the cost and how? what am I going to really do about it? Mm -hmm. And when we at least consider, if not integrate the cost, there's a possibility that the ego is both matured and tempered. Because there's something about cutting things into pieces that tends to inflate the ego when it swings from the polarities. So we see the preacher on the pulpit really aligned with his or her concepts of virtue and is fantasizing or presenting themselves as the embodiment of a long list of virtues and feeling rather big and luminous and really lambasting people, and then conversely, being home and in private, and perhaps participating in some kind of strange and destructive erotic life, and feeling secretly exalted, overwhelmed, possessed by whatever Mm -hmm. this other part of the life is. And when these two things are brought together, creates a lot of heat. It might create a lot of suffering. And one of the things is the bottom falls out of the ego's arrogance. 
and suddenly we're we're like in the mud with everyone else mm -hmm. just you know trying to pull our feet out of the swamp so we can take a step it's very hard to be lordly yeah when we're seeing the paradox you know and i think you're you're leaning into the realm of shadow, Joseph. And the thing is that when we cut off our knowledge of the shadowy parts of ourselves, then we're likely to project those out onto the world and say, okay, well, I, that's not me. I'm not doing anything wrong. But when we can integrate an awareness of our own shadow, that does puncture this sort of ego inflation it is helpful to say, like you said, Deb, I'm, I'm looking at this and yes, I am being inconsistent. I'm being hypocritical. I'm having my hamburger, even though I know <laughs> that there's terrible suffering. And I can at least not shy away from that knowledge. I can, I can hold them both. I'm back on your phrase, Joseph, about chopping things up and the image of dismemberment, which uh, is part of a lot of uh, fairy tales, and how that kind of brutality inflates the ego, of what that does when compartmentalization becomes dismembering parts of ourselves. <clears throat> and of course, there's a very famous fairy tale about that, Bluebeard, <clears throat> where the, the denial, the compartmentalization really was, a, the, the shadow was, you know, something ghastly. This, the brief story that, you know, Lisa, you can help me with this, of the man who comes courting in his fine carriage, and he stops off at the home of uh, three young maidens of marriageable age, and he has such a lovely, wonderful carriage and beautiful horses, and his beard, however, is blue, and that is really odd. And the mother notices, they all notice, but he seems like such a fine gentleman that they discount the fact that his beard is blue. And off he goes with daughter number one, and uh, she's never seen again, daughter number two. Daughter number three uh, also goes off to um, marry this man with the blue beard who takes her to his beautiful mansion, and everything is fine. Uh, and then he has to go on a business trip. And he says, look, while, while I'm gone, you know, here are the keys to the house. Here are the key. You open all, all the doors. You have access to everything except, see this little key right here at the end? Don't use that one. And, of course, he's gone for day one and day two. And finally, of course, human nature being what it is, the suspense is just killing her and she has to find the door that that key fits, and she has to open it. And when she does, she sees inside the room this giant basin and the bodies of other dead women, including her sisters, and blood and gore and body parts all over the place. And, of course, the tale ends happily ever after. Sometimes her brothers come to rescue her. Sometimes she disguises herself and uses trickery to get away. But it's a really gory tale about what can happen when compartmentalization goes too far and we wind up chopping ourselves into pieces. Well, and it also, I mean, it, it shows up in a couple of ways. First of all, in this, which you alluded to, you know, it's like, well, he's got a blue beard, but we're going to ignore that because he's really wealthy, yes. which we do this kind mm -hmm. of thing. It's like, well, you know, the the trip to Europe is going to not be good for the climate, but I really, really want to go see all these fabulous things, you know, and it'll be fun, just to use an example. But but all of us have, have things that we do like that. And, and also then this image of what's in the room that we don't want to know about. We both are ineluctably drawn to open that room. But in a, a part of us, it's like that, I'm going to seal that room off. That's going to be something I just don't think about. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, so what do we seal off? What don't we, what questions don't we ask? And one of the examples that comes to my mind is, um, I, I listened to this interview with Sue Klebold, who is the mother of Dylan Klebold, 
who was one of the shooters at the Columbine massacre that took place in 1999 in Colorado in the U.S. And I think at that, at that time, it was the, the worst uh, school shooting to date, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Sue Klebold has written a book about it. It's called A Mother's Reckoning, and I, I really recommend the book. It's a, it's a great book. But she tells the story about Eric Harris was the other was the other kid that that he was the kind of mastermind who sort of led her son down this road, uh, at least according to her. And most of the time, the boys uh, spent time at Eric's house. But one night, Eric Harris came over to spend the night, and he brought a huge duffel bag which um, Sue, I think, just sort of assumed maybe was recording equipment or something. And the boys took the duffel bag down to the basement and made there what later became known as these famous basement tapes, where they recorded themselves talking about what they were going to do. And what in fact was in the bag were weapons, were guns. And uh, Sue said something on the Terry Gross interview that I listened to, like, what you know, I didn't ask to look in the bag. And I just found myself really struck by that. Like, what would have happened if she had said, Eric, let me see what's in the bag? What would have happened if they had asked to see what was in the bag? But in some sense, you know, in a very kind of human forgivable way, she didn't want to know. She didn't want to know. I mean, one of the one of the points about her book is like you can be a really good parent and really not know things about your kid, which I I give credence to that. You know, I mean, we're not omniscient, but it but what, where do we each, everyone, all of us, choose to ignore certain things, choose to not open the bag? I think we all do it. And, and I think it's, it's a little bit of that bluebeard. What do we lock away and not want to know about? And that's another example, I think, of compartmentalization. That again, does it always have disastrous com- consequences? Absolutely not. Does it allow us to get on with our day? Yes. Does it sometimes have shockingly horrible consequences? Yes. It takes me back to what you said uh, at the outset, Lisa, that we are complicated. Yeah. Life is complicated. Uh, We can't pay attention to everything. Can't be conscious of of everything. But perhaps we can be more conscious of what we are choosing and more conscious of what are we doing with our attention? What are we paying attention to? And what are we not paying attention to? Now, you know, I, for example, pay no attention whatsoever, ever, to any social media. I don't, that's just, I don't do it. Now, the question that comes up in my mind in this context is, you know, am I consciously directing my attention to things that really matter or am I compartmentalizing in a way that could kind of come back to bite me of uh, something that's going on out there that I could only access on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or something like that um, that I'm not even going to know about? But I, So I think it just becomes a pretty thorny issue of how do we manage our attention? And maybe with that, we change our attention and (laughs) focus it on a dream did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone we're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing balance insight and guidance as we make key decisions at 28 charles felt lost and isolated He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During dream school's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motifs that shape your life, 
Reveal unknown facets of your personality. Unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. Today's dream comes from a woman who is 48 years old, and she works as an adjudicator. And here is the dream. I'm seeing the scene from the sky. There is a city in a desert. This city looks like a mirab. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And she says it looks like a prayer rug. It's like a niche and it has a circle in its center. And then she notes in a parenthesis that a mirab in ancient Persia uh, was the, considered the birthplace of the sun. And they were caves where the goddess Anahit, the great deity of the water, gave birth to her son Mithra. Anahita was the original virgin mother, some scholars believe. These mirabs were often caves with water running through them and were temples of worship of Mithra and his mother. Okay, so we have this image of this mirab. Okay, she says, In the dream, at the top of this niche, there is a hidden or secret door. Only some can go through the door, which opens to an exclusive world. I see a monk in black robes going through the city and through this door. Then I hear, the name of the city is Menu. In fact, all of the ancient world, including South Asia, when they spoke of city, they meant Menu. Cities in dreams, also Menu. And she notes that Menu is an old Farsi word that means the heavens or realm of spirit. And she notes, I am Persian or Iranian. I have been practicing Zen for a couple of years with a Zen master. Before that, I was in analysis for six to seven years. Between Zen and analysis, I have been able to connect deeply with the unconscious and work on an old trauma and resolve some complex post-traumatic stress disorder issues. I'm very happy in life, but I am going through a year of significant change My son is leaving for university. My dog passed away. I am finishing a new degree and have just finished my deep reevaluation of my vocational choices. I am also planning a two-week Zen retreat in the fall after taking my son to university. I am single and have been for the last 10 years and have lived a monastic celibate life for six years. It wasn't initially by choice, but it became clear that it was much needed for me to deal with some deep childhood traumas, which I think I have at a very deep level. And she notes, I was in awe by the symbolism of the dream. The dream was repeated all night and was present and came back even after me waking up a couple of times. She says, the monk reminded me of the Zen master, but also of myself. The niche shape of the city was quite a powerful image but from prayer rugs and from the old Persian symbolism. The word Manu was also very important and its universality. The back door was very important and the secret chambers behind it, which I didn't get to see. So we we have this kind of central image of this mirab, which is, I, I think it's sort of like a keyhole shape. We all looked it up, and so we we have the the three of us have the image, but it almost looks like a keyhole. And what we learned from uh, Wikipedia, these are niches in the walls of a mosque that indicate the direction of Mecca towards which Muslims Muslims should face when praying. It's uh, quite uh, an important symbol, and it reminds me, it it makes me think a little bit of the... um, kind of the the image of the world navel in Roman times, that this is kind of the center that provides access to the other realm. I find that this dream makes me think a little bit of Jung's Liverpool dream. Mm. Oh. 
because it it it's an image of the city as the psyche perhaps and that there is a central point within the city that images the the self or the point of contact with the divine i think that's a really interesting and apropos association and just to uh, review the liverpool dream for Uh, listeners, and for this listener in particular, Jung had a dream that he was in the city of Liverpool with some colleagues. Uh, And it's in his book, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. So I won't recall it with uh, completeness or perhaps even total accuracy. But in the foggy, rainy city of Liverpool, Uh, he could see a place that was lit up with some mysterious light, and all the roads kind of converged on this center image. And in the center of Liverpool was a magnolia tree in bloom that was lit up. And one of his companions said, oh my goodness, I don't know why anybody would ever live here. And uh, Jung in the dream thought, I know very well uh, why they're here. And he took From that, after his years of uh, his confrontation with the unconscious, um, he took from that that the center is the goal, and everything is directed through this toward the center, and the principle of the self with a capital S, that place of of wholeness that is both indwelling and transcendent and mysterious. And I think all of us looked up what a mirab is on Wikipedia, and it's very magical. It's shaped like a keyhole, and you can Google it. It's very ornate, Um, and it's a threshold. It's a doorway that that, Mm, that joins, uh, connects, and both connects and separates the realms. And we might say the realms of, you know, matter and spirit, ego and the unconscious, and that here is the monk, uh, the figure, the image, the symbol of what can traverse the realms, what can go have access to both sides. Uh, Interestingly for me, the dreamer is seeing this scene from the sky, and there is a city in a desert. And that's the place that I think reminds reminded you of, of Jung's Liverpool dream of something transcendent and beautiful in what was otherwise a, an unappealing surround, the foggy, rainy city of Liverpool or a desert. And oftentimes when people see something from on high or people dream that they're watching something on a television set or as a movie or a theater performance, it's something that is coming more closely into consciousness. Yeah, but there is a kind of remove from yes. it. And and for me with the streamer, you know, she mentions um, complex PTSD. And a lot of times when we have trauma, one of the ways we deal with it is by kind of holding it somewhat aloof. We might compartmentalize or or intellectualize. And and I do think that Zen practice is as rich a tradition as that is it does help us to do just that. It helps us to keep things a little bit at a distance. She is, you know, kind of somewhat above this scene. Um, so, so I think both senses are there that it's kind of coming into focus more. Clearly, you know, she mentions that this is a time of real change for her and real transformation. And it, it is, Deb, Deb, I loved your word, threshold, because this dream kind of shows a threshold experience. I'm drawn to the tension between being Farsi, whose ancient roots are in Zoroastrianism, and the Islamic uh, niche or mirab. And this is an ancient tension that the Arabic world invaded Iran in ancient times and changed the culture, making it more uh, Arabian and more Muslim. But the underlying strata is much more ancient. Zoroastrianism is a primal religion 
that has to do with light and the polarity of goodness and evil and how that's resolved. Their deity, Mithra. So I'm wondering if it's speaking in some way to the role of Zen Buddhism in resolving the tension between Zoroastrianism and Islamic religion, which I think and I could imagine play out on an unconscious level. And that as she views this from above, because the scene is from the sky, the benefit of her Zen practice is to become highly objective and observant. And when she rises high enough in her objectivity, she can see these ancient interplays, and she's able to find the secret door at the top of this, where the Zen monk, or this particular kind of objective attitude, is able to bring her into, I think, a resolution of the tension between these values. The word Minu is a female Persian name, and as she says, it means heaven or the realm of spirit. So that as she is able to transcend the religious and social and cultural dynamics of this tension, which is still alive in Iranian culture, by the way, she's able to move into a spiritual attitude that I think transcends that tension. She says that she's dealing with some deep childhood traumas and PTSD. At 48 years old, in the first several years of her life, if she had been living in Iran at that time, she would have been part of the horrific war, the cultural war that went on, civil war, that went on in Iran and wiped away uh, the prevailing culture and the freedoms that the Iranian people enjoyed and returned it to a kind of medieval system, which totally disenfranchised women. So I suspect in the secret chamber, above all of that tumult, there is a capacity to hold what has happened to her and to her culture and to cultivate this profound observing consciousness, which Jung called the observing ego, so that one foot is in the lived experience and another foot is in the observing experience. And the interplay of those two dynamics, I would hope, and perhaps the dream is integrating, or excuse me, is indicating that this is a possible attitude. And Joseph, I think you're, you're really on to something there, and I think that maybe helps explain the very big archetypal symbols in the dream that when there's been that depth of trauma, sometimes the psyche really leans right into these huge universal symbols because it takes that to contain that kind of experience. And in this context, um, Donald Kalshed, K-A-L-S-C-H-E-D, has written a book called The Soul and Trauma, and he's a Jungian who's noted uh, for his work with trauma, uh, that both, uh, and that this dream honors exactly what you're talking about, of there's soul and trauma. Yes, I think, I think we're left somewhat in awe of the dream and its symbols, just as the dreamer was. So, so maybe it's just right to say thank you. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.